Thanks very much. Yeah, I would like to start by uh, thanking Stephen for, for inviting me here and for apologizing uh, if my talk uh, doesn't relate so closely to the main theme of the conference. But hopefully there will be a few uh, parts of contact. So I'd like to just start by asking a general question, uh, which uh, touches upon what uh, we've already been discussing this morning. So what determines awareness of visual stimuli? Well, I'm just going to flash something quickly here. And maybe you saw something, maybe it was an outdoor scene, but probably you didn't uh, see it completely. And obviously the timing here is not perfect given this, this laptop. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll flash it again. And that one was a little bit slower, so you probably had a better idea that it was an outdoor scene that happens to be where uh, I grew up in Rio. So, oh no, that's, uh, that one is Pão de Açúcar. Corcovado is on the side. So, so this issue of understanding uh, the factors determining awareness of visual stimuli has fascinated uh, a lot of people, obviously. And, for instance, a lot of work in the 90s uh, suggested that there were serious limitations to, to, to the processing of visual stimuli. Uh, and then there would be uh, kind of the combined result of the, these studies suggested the, the great need for attention. So things like change blindness that everyone has seen this example here, which happens to be appropriate where I am now today. Uh, this thing going on and off. Attentional blink and, and many other classes of related uh, experimental paradigms really showing the need for attention for more uh, in-depth processing. So in a sense, that can be summarized by a model that was quite prevalent in which there would be a pre-attentive stage that would be processing relatively basic features such as orientation, color, intensity, and so on. But only after you pass this gate here, this attentive gate, then you would get into something, uh, an attentive uh, processing uh, realm in which you would be able to do things like uh, maintain information in working memory, make perceptual decisions, uh, shift things into long-term memory, and so on and so forth. So the idea then is that, is, I apologize, it's a little bit light here, given the, these, these lights. I don't know if it's possible to, to uh, lower these lights here at the front, but anyway, that non-basic visual inf information processing, and that is, things that are not this, require attention. However, at the same time, and roughly, uh, roughly uh, in parallel, in, in fact, in the 90s, there was a suggestion that there was a critical exception to this type of, of processing, which is the processing of emotional stimuli. So the idea here uh, that was uh, largely motivated by the work of Ledoux and, and several others is that there would be specialized pathways that would rapidly convey emotional information or emotion-laden information to structures such, such, that, such as the amygdala, which are really critical for the processing of these kinds of stimuli, thereby leading uh, for the person here to, pr even though the person is not looking at, paying attention to, or anything, but just the fact that the stimulus is hitting his retina, the person will successfully run away and survive. The thinking was, and still to some extent is, that uh, this type of processing that is uh, special relies on a subcortical pathway. I mean, the names here don't, don't matter if you're not into the anatomy. This is the superior colliculus. This is a structure called the pulvinar. It's the nucleus in the thalamus. But anyway, there's, this is the regular pathway that we study in textbooks. Uh, activation uh, signals go from the, from the retina to the lateral nucleus in the thalamus to primary visual cortex, V1, secondary visual cortex, V2, and so on, and eventually reach the amygdala. But the idea then is actually you can bypass this whole thing and go all subcortically very fast, and in that way, that allows you to process emotional stimuli, including complex ones, in a way that is independent of attention, and in fact is, is not, is an, takes place in a non-conscious fashion. 
Indeed, a little bit later, uh, in the late 90s, there were uh, several pieces of evidence that you would get activation in the amygdala, again here considered as a signature of emotional processing, uh, even when uh, subjects were unaware of the stimuli. So kind of converging to this idea that, that the subcortical pathway might be immune uh, to attentional uh, influences and really processing stimuli very fast and in an unaware mode. So in the past 10 or 12 years, uh, one of the goals of the research in my lab has, to be really, has been to understand the roles of both attention and awareness during the processing of such stimuli, including complex scenes, as well as faces and more basic stimuli. The goal has been to study attention by creating tasks that, that deplete processing resources more completely, and by studying awareness via uh, uh, tools like uh, signal detection theory, that allow you to get a, a so-called objective uh, criterion of, of awareness that, that Hakwan was talking about. And so let me just briefly go uh, very quickly here through a series of experiments just to, to, to give you just an idea of the kinds of things that we've done, not the details. We can talk about the details at the end or even a discussion period, but several experiments trying to understand, for instance, the role of attention. So with experiments would go more or less like this. Well, okay, in this kind of trial, you, you tell me if this person is male or female, and you just ignore these peripheral things. In these other blocks of trials, you actually fixate your, your, your gaze here, just move your focus of attention to the periphery, not your eyes, and now tell me if this is the, the same or different orientation. And these things were very small, and orientation differences were, were difficult. So this was a very difficult task. People were doing only 64% correct. This one is a very simple task. And okay, so does it, can you get the effect of um, stimulus valence when, when it's not attended? So if we look here at the, at the amygdala, we see that fearful faces evoke very strong responses, much stronger than the neutral faces. That's the effect of, of valence that has been reported many times in the literature, but not when they're unattended, that is when they're doing the bar orientation task. In this case, they have no differential responses. So our interpretation at the time was that there's really a strong, a strong valence by attention interaction. The effect of stimulus valence depends on attention. This experiment was the first one, has also had all sorts of shortcomings that our uh, colleagues pointed out very um, effectively that, uh, that we had several shortcomings. So we followed, follow up these experiments with a series of, another, of other experiments in which we uh, we used other tasks, uh, we increased the emotional potency of the stimuli, for instance, by having a conditioning phase in the beginning of the, the, the experiment in which they were paired with shock and so on. But the general conclusion uh, was the same in these and in other studies, that essentially this processing was not automatic, it required attention. We also looked at the role of visual awareness, again, in very, very similar uh, masking studies that had been used before, in which a target face, which could be emotional or neutral, was presented briefly, let's say 33 milliseconds or 67 milliseconds, and always followed by a mask. And the subject has to say present absent, and in our case, we used a uh, confidence rating scale so that we could reconstruct uh, re receiver operating characteristic curves, our so-called ROC curves, in which you can plot the hit rate versus the false alarm rate. The hit rate is the hit rate in which you correctly detect uh, a fearful face, let's say in this case, and when it's present, and the false alarm rate is when you say fear, even though there's nothing emotional there, there's no fearful face there. So if you are at a chance, you're around this, this 33, per, this, excuse me, this diagonal line here, which was what happening when the targets were shown for 33 milliseconds. For targets at 67 milliseconds, you actually are much better, and so you can do that better than chance. So like, our operational definition of awareness was based on these uh, ROC curves, either a chance along the diagonal or better than chance. So what we were interested in, in, in investigating was whether responses to uh, the stimulus valence, that is trials con that physically contained a fearful face and versus trials in which there, wa there were no fearful faces, what would happen in the amygdala? Again, this structure that was suggested to be this, this uh, key stage or, 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 or a structure that would provide a neural signature for, for fear processing.
even in the unaware mode. So what we found is that for 67 milliseconds for which the subjects were aware, we found, as others had in the past, uh, bilateral activation in the amygdala, but when it was unaware, independent of threshold, we did not find differential activation. So if you, as you know, uh, these kinds of maps are subject to a threshold, and that's to some extent arbitrary, but if, you, if we lower the threshold, we never got any systematic activation here. We just kind of get some sprinkled uh, salt and pepper noise throughout the whole image without any structure that would resemble this case here. However, at the time, we also noticed that something that was curious, we started noticing a lot of inter-individual variability, something that hadn't been described in the liter literature before. And what we found is that subjects can detect for instance, subjects can detect uh, 33 millisecond uh, stimuli, unlike the previous group that I was just showing you, this is one individual, 25 millisecond stimuli and even 17 millisecond stimuli. So there's quite a lot of variability. So if we go back to the other set of data and we now split the data into those who, who, who were aware at 67 milliseconds and unaware at 33 milliseconds, this, these are the exact the same data that I just showed you before. So we, we found 19 of, uh, of the subjects that behave this manner. But we also found eight subjects that were actually aware at 33 milliseconds. So for them, what we found, even though it was a small group of eight subjects, quite robust activation at 67 milliseconds and a little bit of activation at 33 milliseconds. But again, consistent with the idea that uh, that these differential activations in the amygdala require awareness. Okay, just very briefly now, uh, another paradigm in which we extended this uh, investigation of awareness and kind of mixed it with attention by using a paradigm called the attentional blink. The attentional blink is a task in which a rapid stream of stimuli is presented, is flashed at you, each one around 100 milliseconds or so, and then your goal is to detect two targets in this sequence. One in this, in our study, one was a face, the other one was a house or a building. So you had to say whether this was Andy, Bill, or Chad, and you had been familiarized with them in the beginning. You knew uh, that this was, I don't know, Andy, and then by the end of the stream here, you would say, this is Andy, and, and then you had to say that this was a house, not a building. Well, the attentional blink paradigm, if you're not familiar with it, is such that if you correctly detect T1, in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases, you actually miss the second, of the two, the second stimulus, T2, quite, a, quite often. So you, you, miss, you miss it as if you had blinked. I mean, so you're not physically blinking. You, what you're having is, as it, as, if, as it were, an attentional blink. So we studied this, this paradigm with one modif modification, which was what well, essentially before the experiment started, we actually paired buildings with shock or houses with shock counterbalance across subjects. And before people uh, start uh, booing me here and, and kicking me out of, of, of the stage, these are very mild uh, uh, shocks that are uncomfortable but not painful and the subjects themselves choose the level and obviously at any point they can leave and say you know I'm don't want to do this experiment and having this done this more than a thousand times I think I had one or two people say you know what I'm not going to continue but anyway so what we found was that what we found was interesting uh, that there was an enhancement of the detectability of the shock paired category relative to the unshock paired category. So if houses for that subject were paired with shock, people would miss it less. This paradigm also offers us the possibility of looking at missed trials. There are always a certain number of, of trials that are missed. And the way we designed this task, in which there was physically a face here and actually physically a house or a building here, was because there is a region in the visual cortex called, doesn't really matter the name, but for those of you that might be more familiar with, 
these regions, the parahippocampal gyrus, that is a region that is very sensitive to outdoor scenes. And people think they might be responsible for navigation and, and layout and, and, and other kinds of processing. That is very sensitive to these kinds of uh, houses and, 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 and buildings, but responds rather limited to very little, almost none at all, to these, to these, how, to these faces. In other words, we can use responses here as an index of essentially what's the neural fate of this missed T2. Because physically it was present, so there's physically a house or a building here, it just was missed, which is the attentional blink phenomenon itself. So what we were interested in understanding was that, again, in terms of the role of awareness, we can take the missed trials and try to see is there a difference that observed between the shocked paired and the shocked unpaired, the not shocked paired, in the amygdala? Again, if there were, there would be evidence for this kind of unaware, unconscious uh, uh, processing evoking responses in the amygdala. What we found, on the other hand, was that at the time, the, the, this hemodynamic response with fMRI has a, a given lag, around four or six seconds. At the time that we should be expecting the responses to to the, to the um, outdoor scenes, the, 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 the buildings and the houses, we found no differential evidence, uh, no evidence for differential activation between shock paired and shock unpaired. Uh, if you are wondering why the, res why the response goes down here, it's actually, uh, several other studies have shown that when people are doing a very effortful tasks, and this is a very effortful task here, uh, actually, activation in the amygdala do, does go down relative to the overall baseline. Nonetheless, the, the relative deflections here sh should still be preserved. So let me summarize this rather uh, quickly just by saying that I agree with many others in the literature, ourselves have uh, found this many times as well, that effective processing is prioritized. There's no question about that. But it also depends on top-down factors, such as attention, awareness, and either other contextual effects that I didn't have time to go into here today. So my suggestion is, unlike other proposals out there, is that the effective processing is not strongly automatic. Okay, so let me uh, discuss this issue more broadly in terms of uh, the anatomy that is behind these effects that has been suggested to be behind these effects. So it has been suggested that a lot of these effects have to do with this subcortical pathway reaching the amygdala in this fast, automatic fashion. I would claim that we might be actually looking at anatomy and this problem from the wrong angle in the sense that if you uh, look at the amygdala, it's actually one of these structures that is most densely interconnected in the brain. In fact, uh, Larry Swenson and colleagues have estimated that it has on the order of 500 to 1,000 or even more connections between this subcortical structure, the amygdala, and other subcortical structures as well as all the way around throughout cortex. It's densely interconnected with cortex as well. So based on this, uh, Ralph Adolfs and I suggested that instead of thinking of this, what we call the standard model in which there is a subcortical pathway, that we should kind of abandon this model and we actually should uh, consider other models. This is just one example and in here just shown in a very simplified fashion in which some, some of these subcortical, subcortical regions, for instance, an important subcortical region here in the, was called the pulvinar, uh, actually play very different roles in integrating information with many other brain sites, cortical sites for that matter, that are really important for uh, the evaluation of affective significance, including the orbital frontal cortex, the cingulate cortex, the insula, and so on and so forth. So let me uh, just uh, give you one more example about, of how emotional content, which we know prioritizes uh, processing, shapes both perception and brain responses. So what we want to understand is that how does it affect visual cortical processing and at the same time behavior? <clears throat> 
So one really interesting aspect is that visual, the visual cortex is reliably modulated by emotional content. So if we take our, uh, this, the first study that I showed in which they had the, either do the bar task or the male-female task, when they were attending to the faces during the, the male and female task, large extents of visual cortex were more strongly driven by the fearful face relative to the neutral face. And this was not our finding. Many other groups had reported this or were reporting this at the same time. So this was something that was well known. The question that we've had more recently was, okay, so there's a lot of visual cortex that is engaged more strongly by emotion. But how early is this effect? One thing that I was very interested in was, is this as early as primary visual cortex? A lot of people had made a big deal out of, uh, out of the fact that attention was influencing early visual processing as early as uh, primary visual cortex, V1. So this is what we wanted to study. So to study this, we use the stimulus that the visual system really likes, essentially that matches the receptive field of V1 response, of, of V1 cells, which is called a Gabor patch. And essentially what we did, obviously the visual, res the visual system responds very strongly to the, stimula, but the stimulus, but what we did in the manipulation was to actually, again, in a conditioning phase prior to the actual experiment, we paired it with shock. So the task itself was a very simple detection task in which it was shown very briefly, 50 milliseconds, and here is just shown schematically, so it's very faint near threshold, and subjects had to respond whether it was present or absent. And I should remind you that all the trials that we are uh, analyzing here don't actually contain physical shock. They just have the potential of physical, physical shock. The ones that actually have physical shock, we actually... Uh, exclude from the analysis uh, and, 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 and don't, inc don't include in the results that I'm going to be showing you. So essentially behaviorally what we found was that the ones that were paired with shock which were much better detected, in fact suggesting that was an increase in, in, in detection sensitivity and not just an arousal response when you analyze the data in terms of D prime so that you can take into account false alarms. In terms of the neural data, what we saw was that the stronger the signal on a given trial, and we did this on a trial by trial basis, the larger the, the stronger the signal in visual area V1, the larger the probability that the subject will correctly detect it. Across subjects, if we take this slope here as the strength of the effect, the steeper the, the slope, the stronger the effect, across subjects, what we see is that the shock paired one is always significantly larger than the, the, the one that was not paired with shock, showing the advantage for effectively significant stimuli, stimuli as early as uh, uh, primary visual cortex. Okay, so how does this happen? What's, what's going on here? How can the primary visual cortex, visual cortex uh, in general, be so sensitive to emotional content? Well, David Amaral, and colleagues have shown that, for instance, that the amygdala, several amygdala regions here, this is schematically shown, have strong connections all throughout visual cortex, including V1, as well as later stages of processing. So there is a, a substrate for the amygdala to assess the emotional significance of a stimulus, and via this assessment, then modulate visual processing to facilitate and prioritize effectively significant stimuli, leading to these kinds of effects here in which uh, emotional faces evoke greater responses than neutral faces. So essentially what we have is a, is a, is a scheme in which the amygdala is, is actually um, modulating all, the, uh, all stages of ventral visual cortex so that they actually have their, they, their uh, they are prior. They are, they are strengthened, and they are in by, by by being by that virtue, they are actually um, pr their processing is prioritized. So one of the things that I want to discuss now is is <coughs> so. <coughs> this is an example of uh, of substrates for interactions that I just showed, but there is a lot more that suggests that. Regions that are involved in emotional processing are extremely well connected. 
we had already seen this, this scheme here showing that the amygdala has uh, connectivity that is very broad. In fact, the, the, active, uh, the, the, the effect is sufficiently broad that when we look at uh, typical fear conditioning studies in which people have focused on responses in the amygdala, what we see is that there is extensive, uh, that affective signals are influencing large portions of lateral and medial uh, prefrontal cortex. So the effects are really quite broad and don't, are not restricted to a, a region or two. So the hypothesis that I would like to advance here is that these regions uh, that are involved in affective emotional processing might be in fact topologically central. And I'll clarify that in the next slide and maybe part actually of what has been called an inner core circuit that is densely interconnected. So in a, in a recent analysis, uh, a very large analysis of um, all uh, known connectivity, uh, I, and I believe it was mostly monkey, but it might have included uh, some data from different species as well. Uh, Moda and Singh showed the really dramatically, uh, the dramatic extent to which connectivity uh, links all parts of the brain. But not only that, that within that really dense connectivity shown here, there is what they call an inner core circuit, which is a subset of regions that are more strongly connected with the other regions of this inner core as well as regions outside the core. So it's as if there is this backbone through which information flows very e efficiently because they're extremely well connected. And what we notice in this backbone is that it contains lots of these regions that are typically linked to emotion. For instance, the amygdala, the anterior insula, parts of singular cortex, orbital frontal cortex, and so on. Supporting the suggestion that uh, some of these uh, effectively related regions might form this, might be part, they're not exclusively, uh, there are other kinds of regions that are there too, but they might be part of this inner core circuit. The so, so what we're seeing here is dramatic uh, potential for interactions, but these, these are, are of a structural nature. They're also uh, potential for interactions that are functional in nature. So for instance, one study that we did, we looked at the uh, pattern of correlate, correlated signals in early visual cortex, cortex areas V1, V2, V3, V4 during an affective context in which the regions exhibited more correlated or coherent firing responses when it was in, a, in an affective state relative to during a neutral state. So as, as if there's more communication or a more coherent signaling between these regions during the threat sta stage, during the, the, during the threat uh, sta state versus a neutral condition. Okay, so based on all of this, uh, then there, a question, a natural question then is how, how should we understand emotion and cognition in the brain? So one way that we can think about it, and we have thought about the brain a lot, is in terms of brain regions. This region does one thing, this region does another thing, this other region does another thing, and so on and so forth. And there has been some progress based on this kind of approach. I would like to suggest that we, we move away, and lots of people are suggesting this, so it's, it's, not, it's not, not my idea. But... Uh, siding with this movement of moving away from areas to going to networks so that we understand these networks of brain regions instead of just areas. But more than that, uh, adopting a scheme that is sufficiently flexible that given regions, so let's say here I was saying that this region here is part of this network here, this region here is part of this network here. I'm suggesting actually that we shouldn't even think in those terms, we should go beyond that and think that even whether a region is within a network or another is actually contextually dependent. So this is highly, highly dynamic and contextually dependent 
So depending on the situation at hand, they form these coalitions of regions that combine then are able to implement certain computations that together then will affect some kind of landscape of behaviors that for simplicity we could say have affective and cognitive dimensions, but obviously this is a grossly oversimplified scheme. But that what we're having with what we're having at any given point is that at any given point we are at some point in this landscape that externally might be convenient to label as more cognitive or more affective, but in fact it really should be viewed as a, an affective cognitive uh, uh, surface or space. So, in one way that I like to summarize uh, how we should understand emotion and cognition in the brain is to say that there are no cognitive or emotional brain regions per se, that in fact they are much more closely integrated and interrelated than generally assumed or de described. Okay, so let me try to finish in the next uh, few minutes so that we can have some questions. Uh, all right, this is nice, but in a sense I was asked to come to something that was connected to consciousness. And so let me try to provide some ideas here. Uh, and, and it would be good to see your feedback to see if you think this makes sense. Okay, in terms of consciousness and emotion, a lot of people have suggested, have suggested that, for instance, one interesting property is the fact that if structures that are important for emotion, things like the brainstem, the midline cortices, right at the midline, they actually uh, are also important, they're also recognized as structures that are important for conscious, for, for regulating the, 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 the level of consciousness. So for instance, this is a, a quote that I take from this, this paper here from uh, Suchia and, and, and Adolf's. But this is a point that has been made by many, many other investigators. Damasio has made this point uh, a while, a long ago. And again, many others have talked about this. Again, so this is not really an original uh, thought. In, ter in terms of thinking about uh, consciousness and emotion, it's also interesting to think about the regions that are, uh, uh, that are most, mostly directly linked to effects of anesthesia, anesthetic effects. So for instance, regions such as the thalamus and, and other, like the anterior cingular cortex and so on. So some of these regions do overlap with regions that are typically thought to be emotional or important for emotional processing. But many others don't, like parietal lobe and tem temporal parietal occipital uh, junction and so on and so forth. So it's interesting to note that uh, in some recent reviews, it has, it has in, in this uh, review by Alkiri, Tononi, and colleagues, there has been highlighted, and others have highlighted this as well, that there's no region in terms of anesthesia. There's no region that appears to be necessary so that you can get anesthetic effects. And not even the thalamus, which is thought to be one region that at one point it was always involved, uh, was, was, uh, would, would, would be necessary for disconnecting subcortical and cortical regions, seems to be necessary. So in the same, in the same paper by Alkiri and, and Tononi, they suggest that what anesthetics might be doing is disrupting cortical integration so in a, in a way that they act, by acting on structures like the thalamus that facilitate long-range interactions, cortical or cortical interactions. And regions like that could be, as I said, the thalamus or the posterior medial cortex and, or, or, or other possible structures. And others have info, em, emphasized, like Tononi, that this idea of integration is really critical for for consciousness, so suggesting that in, in his in his words that information and integration might be the very essence of, of consciousness. And this idea of, of integration has been um, described by many by many people. I'm going to go a little bit faster here. <clears throat> 
But uh, so we looked at one of our studies to see to try to see if we could find evidence of this. So what we found, what we investigated in our study was that after a certain cue that indicated that a shock could happen, subjects waited two to six seconds to do, to do a response interference task to say this was a house or a building where in, 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 uh, in, uh, in trials in which uh, the word and the, the, the picture could be congruent or incongruent. So this is just a typical Stroop-like task. But the part that we were really interested in was this delay period here in which people could receive a shock. And again, we were analyzing the trials in which they did not receive a shock. So it's just the anticipation and monitoring for the possibility of shock. If we look at the brain regions that are actually engaged in that monitoring process, there are several of them, and we don't have to agonize about which ones, but if you care uh, about uh, these kinds of regions, that things like anterior insula, the thalamus, basal forebrain, and so on and so forth. But what we were interested in doing was to actually perform a network the, uh, 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 graph theoretic analysis on, on these data to look at this issue of integration of information to see if we can get some clues about that. So to do these analysis, uh, which are becoming very, uh, that are very popular in, our, in, our Im in, in, in brain imaging work, it's very straightforward because all you need to do is, is get some regions and those regions are your nodes of your graph. And then what you need to do, you need to, to find some connection or path between the nodes with some strength, for instance. And what you can do for that, you can take the, uh, the correlation, uh, the time series correlation between two regions, so for instance. You can take uh, this region here has a certain time series, this region here has a certain time series, and you can take that correlation between the two time series as the strength of that connection. In this case, not anatomical strength, functional strength. So when we do that, we can do all sorts of graph theoretical tools, like for instance, we can do what's called community detection, which is essentially like a, a clustering algorithm that finds clusters that are more linked to themselves than to other things. And so what it finds here, for instance, is a, uh, essentially a cortical cluster of regions and a subcortical cluster of regions that are linked within themselves but also across themselves. But they are more intensely linked within themselves than across. That's the nature of finding this partition by these community detection algorithms. So this is during the safe condition. The safe condition was when they received a cue that said, in this condition, you're never going to be shocked. And they were never shocked. So what happens when they have that other uh, diamond, in, I think, in the example, that shows that in the threat condition? What happens is that the correlations between the time series of these regions increases. So the functional connectivity, the functional links between these, the, between these two communities, this, the cortical one here and the subcortical here, was increased. So the suggestion that uh, I would make is that what threat does there in, in that case, in our example, is that it's actually increasing integration in a way that, in this example, makes cortex and subcortex actually less segregated. Okay, I have like around five minutes, right? Yeah, so let's see if I can go through this in five minutes. Okay, a, a, lot, of, a lot of authors have suggested that consciousness depends on, on things like information, where information integration, where information would be something roughly the amount of a distinct number of states possible or, or something like complexity or something like causal density and so on and so forth. So with this in mind then, does increased integration that we just saw in, 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 in that graph theoretic sense increase or decrease information or complexity? I would claim that probably both. So let me give you an example that is not experimental, but it would be interesting to do this experiment. Well, not exactly how it's shown here, but to do a version of this experiment. So here what I'm saying is that in cases in which emotion is more extreme, there's probably a, de 
the integration actually leads to more uh, to, 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 to the responses being more like each other to a, to a point where there's a decrease of effective information. For instance, in the case where you have generating of stereotypical responses when something is something as threatening as this is essentially making you behave in a very stereotypical way, which is you completely shut down and you run away. However, there might be other cases. There might be other cases in less extreme emo emotional situations in which there, they, 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 in, there may be an increase in, in the inf in increase in information. So, very briefly here, uh, what we did in this task uh, was actually a two-choice two task in which subjects had to say if it was a fearful or disgusted uh, face. And this was actually super threshold, super liminal. They were shown for 83 milliseconds. So it was challenging, but it was not a, a, a threshold task. So, in, and they saw a neutral face, but also they saw morphs going to, to disgusted and morphs going to fearful. So what we saw was a series of regions that were predictive, for instance, of fearful or disgusted regions. So in the case of fearful here, which was one that one I, the one I want to highlight, there was activation throughout the brain in many, many spots that responses from those voxels predicted whether the person would say fearful or disgusted, even when the face was very ambiguous. So there's this distri distributed predictiveness for lack of a better term, mean that there's more information. So to study this, we actually uh, went back to a masking task that we had studied before, and we tried to use uh, voxels in the brain to see if they could be used to predict the behavioral response the subject had made on those trials. So what I'm showing here is these maps in which this is not really activation, what this is is a voxel here is predictive of whether the person correctly says present, fear present or absent. So the next thing that we did was try to see, well, okay, there's information in lots of places in the brain, sort of like in this example. But what does that mean? Is this all redundant information or is that something that combines possibly in a, in a synergistic fashion. So to do that, we actually just employed really a traditional standard mutual information analysis in which we, we tried to see how much the fMRI signal could be predictive of behavioral choices. And there are several technical uh, issues here, and given the amount of data that we had, which was not on the thousands and, or, or tens of thousands, we could only look at uh, pairs of regions the combination of signals between pairs of regions and not all, all the regions involved. The computations are fairly standard. You're just computing mutual information by uh, using standard entropy measures. But what I want to show here is that when we took pairs of regions, we saw evidence for a synergistic combination across regions. In other words, when pairs of regions were considered, I was able to more effectively predict behavioral choice than when only single individual regions were considered. Okay? All right, so let me summarize so that I can finish. So, I like to suggest that emotion and perception, or emotion and cognition, per, emotion, perception, and slash cognition are really truly integrated in the brain in a, in a manner that is actually not decomposable. You can't just peek someplace and say this is emotion in the brain, this is cognition in the brain, or this is perception in the brain. Uh, my take is that actually they, these are not decomposable. Right? So leading to something that there is functional specialization of some sort, but there is so much interaction that the separation it becomes an aspect that is not fundamental to our understanding of the system. And this kind of uh, non-decomposability is actually rides on this dense connectivity that guarantees this integration at, across multiple levels as we had seen before. This dense interconnectivity matrix that actually links uh, uh, all areas of the brain.
And finally, my last point is that in linking uh, some of the, the ideas of the talk to, 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 to issues of consciousness, that emotion may increase information integration. So one, one example was the study uh, that I showed you with the Stroop task in which we have obtained evidence with graph theory. But this actually might lead to both, and this is something that I would like to investigate in the future, less complex, if you will, conscious states in which basically you have correlated firing that is actually uh, reducing uh, information in a, in, in a sense. But also there might be other situations in which we have more nuanced or more complex conscious states that uh, uh, in fact allow a more, the space of states actually is amplified. So with that, I would like to, to thank my collaborators. Uh, thanks, uh, I would like to thank the National Institute of Mental Health for, for funding this work. And thank you for your attention.